Hello class, this is Dr. Palmer here and today we're going to be looking at presidential selection, the framers plan. We'll explain the framers original provisions for choosing the president and we'll also outline how the rise of political parties changed the original provisions set out in the Constitution. Here are your vocabulary words, presidential electors, electoral votes, electoral college. In formal terms, the president is chosen according to the provisions of the Constitution. In practice, however, the president is elected through an altogether extraordinary process that is not very well understood by most Americans. That process is a combination of constitutional provisions, state and federal laws, and in large, largest me uh, measure, a number of practices born of the nation's political parties. To make sense of this very complex system, you must first understand what the framers had in mind when they designed the presidential election process. Original Provisions The framers gave more time to the method for choosing the president than to any other, ma um, any other matter. It was, said James Wilson of Pennsylvania, the most difficult of all on which we have had to decide. The difficulty arose largely because most of the framers were against selecting the president by either of the obvious ways, by Congress or by a direct vote of the people. Early in the convention, most of the delegates favored selecting by Congress. Later, nearly all delegates came to believe that congressional selection would, as Alexander Hamilton said, put the president too much under the legislative thumb. Only a few of the framers favored choosing the president by popular vote. Nearly all agreed that such a process would lead to tumult and disorder. Most delegates felt, too, that the people, scattered over so wide an area, could not possibly know enough about the available candidates to make wise, informed choices. George Mason of Virginia spoke for most of his colleagues at the convention when he said, quote, The extent of the country renders it impossible it impossible that the people can have the requisite capacity to judge of the respective pretensions of the candidates." End quote. After weeks of debate, the framers finally agreed on a plan first put forward by Hamilton. Under it, the president and vice president were to be chosen by a special body of presidential electors. These electors would each cast two electoral votes, each for a different candidate. The candidate with the most votes would become president. The person with the second largest number of votes would become vice president. The chart above explains this plan in detail. This is on page 366 of your text. The framers intended the electors to be the most enlightened and respectable citizens from each state. They were to be free agents in choosing the people best quali qualified to fill the nation's two highest offices. The Rise of Parties The Electoral College, then, is the group of people, or electors, chosen from each state and the District of Columbia to formally select the President and Vice President. The original version of the Electoral College worked as the framers intended only as long as George Washington was willing to seek and hold the presidency. He did so twice, and was unanimously elected President in 1789 and again in 1792. Flaws began to appear in the system in 1796, however, with the rise of political parties. John Adams, the Federalist candidate, was elected to the presidency. Thomas Jefferson, an arch-rival of the Democratic-Republican, lost to Adams by just three votes in the electoral balloting. Jefferson then became Adams's vice president. The Election of 1800 The system broke down in the election of 1800. By then, there were two well-defined parties, the Federalists, led by Adams and Hamilton, and the Democratic Republicans, headed by Jefferson. Each of these parties nominated presidential and vice presidential candidates. They also nominated candidates to serve as presidential electors in the several states. Those elector candidates were picked with the clear understanding that if elected, they would vote for their party's presidential and vice presidential nominees. Each of the 73 Democratic Republicans who won posts as electors voted for his party nominees, Jefferson and Aaron Burr. In doing so, they produced a tie for the presidency. Remember that the Constitution gave each elector two votes, each to be cast for a different person, but each to be cast for someone as president. 
Popular opinion clearly favored Jefferson for the presidency, and the party had intended Burr for the vice presidency. Still, the House of Representatives had to, had to take 36 separate ballots before it finally chose Jefferson. The spectacular election of 1800 marked the introduction of three new elements into the process of selecting a president. 1. Party nominations for the president and pres vice president. 2. The nomination of candidates for presidential electors pledged to vote for their party's presidential ticket. And 3. The automatic casting of the electoral votes in line with those pledges. Gone forever was the notion that the electors would act as free agents in the process. The Twelfth Amendment The election of 1800 produced another notable result, the Twelfth Amendment. This amendment was added to the Constitution in 1804 to make certain that there would never be another such fiasco. The amendment is lengthy, but it made only one major change in the Electoral College system. It separated the presidential and vice presidential presidential elections. Quote, the electors shall name in their ballots the person voted for as president, and in district ballots the person voted for as vice president. With the appearance of parties, the election of 1800, and the Twelfth Amendment, the constitutional framework was laid for the presidential selection system as it exists today. That system is, indeed, a far cry from what was agreed to in 1787, as you will see in the sections ahead.